Hello, everybody. I would like to thank you for joining us here today for ABIS webinar on the role of circular economy in rethinking plastics. Um, we are sorry a little bit for the delay, but we were waiting for all of the participants to join us. Um, so today we will be talking about the main challenges and innovative solutions on how to approach this issue and create a thriving economy and a sustainable world. My name is Katarina Halushkova, and I am the Project Communication Specialist at ABIS, the Academy of Business and Society that organized this webinar. Today, we are having three experts. Gavin Barner, the Director of Sustainable Business at Unilever. Hi, Gavin. Good morning, how are you? Uh, second speaker is Fiona Charnley, Associate Professor of Circular Economy at University of Exeter and a former senior lecturer in circular innovation at Cranfield University. Hello, Fiona. Good morning. And Peter Hopkinson, director of the University of Exeter Center for Circular Economy. Hello, Peter, and I welcome you all here. Thanks very much, Katrina. So uh, this webinar is going to last up to one hour. Um, each speaker will have around 10 minutes to talk, so there is going to be plenty of time for your questions and discussions for a Q&A. So please do not hes hesitate to write uh, your questions down throughout the whole webinar. Um, I, can, I, will, I will see it coming and uh, at the end I will make sure that your question is answered. Uh, you, can see, uh, you can see a question um, section at the GoToWebinar platform. And now, without further ado, I will um, share the screen of Gavin, uh, our first presenter, so that we can start. So uh, whenever you're ready, Gavin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Could you just confirm you can see a full screen of my slide? I can, yes. Perfect. Super. So. Uh, yeah, good morning all, as I said earlier. So uh, short of climate change, I think it's pretty clear that one of the other enormous issues of our time has become plastic and specifically plastic waste and how plastic is ending up leaking into the environment, into rivers and oceans. So the reason we've come together to discuss uh, the opportunity is because we believe that the role of circular economy is um, a key one in terms of how we can rethink the material flow for plastics. So I'd like to share a little bit of the insight and the approach that we're taking at Unilever to tackle this challenge. Up. In terms of slide change, are you able to help me there, Katrina? It's just not uh, moving. There we go. So Unilever's purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. It's worth mentioning that back in 2010, we set a vision to grow our business whilst at the same time to decouple the environmental impact. Uh, now I've raised this point because the principles of the circular economy are pretty similar. So a circular economy really is looking to, to decouple um, you know, from the consumption of finite resources. And so there's a natural link into what we might be wanting to um, achieve as a company principles of a circular economy. Strange reason I'm struggling to change slides. Our approach really, when it comes to packaging and plastics, is to use less. And at the same time, what we do use, we need to ensure that we retain its value for longer. And so this is the approach for a long time has always been about reduction, driven mainly by efficiency. But if you combine reduction with circular economy principles, you begin to maximize the value of those materials. It also made perfect sense that the right place for us to start would be to rethink the design and the use of packaging materials in the 400 plus brands that we sell around the world. So this issue and opportunity to address affects all of our brands in the business. It's also really important uh, to recognize the role of thought leadership. The plastics issue is a systemic one. And it requires that there's some very powerful and strategic thinking around what good might look like. We are partners of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, 
who released a report called The New Plastics Economy, Rethinking the Future of Plastics, and introduced a forum called The New Plastics Economy, of which we are a part, to really set the direction and vision for the industry and for the sector across the value chain to address a common vision and try and find solutions for plastics. Current waste-related commitments in the um, are a combination of goals that we set back in 2010 to halve our waste after consumers have used it, and we had around 31% to do. An aggressive program we had to ensure that we had zero waste to landfill uh, across all of our manufacturing sites across the world, which we delivered in 2014, and we track it around 97 to 100 most of the time. And then we added to that in 2017 some really stretching commitments to lead our industry around making all of our plastic packaging recyclable, reusable, or compostable. Um, what we added to that was a commitment to ensure that we use post-consumer recycled resin. So in other words, making sure that we begin to buy and use the plastic that is collected and recycled to make new products. That ambition will need to be rethought as the world moves on and more people try to drive up the infrastructure and collect more plastic materials. In addition to that, the new plastics economy, which I mentioned, uh, worked for a number of years with many players across the value chain to create what's called the global commitment, which sets out to draw a line in the sand on how we might set about to eliminate plastic pollution at the source. Within that commitment, um, there are some additional things that have been added around companies committing to eliminate problematic and unnecessary plastic. And of course, there is a call to look at more reuse models and other ways of rethinking the system. So our focus as a business, as I had already alluded to, was mainly on design, given that's what we're most responsible for. So we need to be smart at thinking about how we design our products. Zero waste program overall within manufacturing operations and an essential element to partner with others and collaborate in order to drive uh, to ensure that no packaging. So within the context of design, um, the important thing is to prevent any packaging becoming pollution use. So the smart things we can begin to do is to reduce the total amount of materials we use by concentrating, compacting or compressing our products and delivering them in smaller packages. We can also look to drive reuse models, refillable uh, solutions for consumers in that um, we then begin to use packaging more than one times, preferably. Um, and then also to look at ensuring that everything is recyclable in the first instance. If we don't design for recyclability, then there's no chance that we can ever actually collect, recover, recycle, and use that again. And of course, there's an element of eliminating materials that are problematic, which is a design solution that would be required. Internally, as a company, we try to find a simple framework that will mobilize um, the organization and people to be inspired to take action in their part of the business. And the way we do that is we talk about um, everybody seeking to create a program or a roadmap of innovation that addresses uh, how they're going to tackle using less plastic, how they might introduce better plastic. So for example, that would be um, designing you know, from complex materials to monomaterials, or it could involve things like the use of recycled plastics in, in a uh, manufacturer of a bottle of shampoo, for example. And then no plastic would speak for itself that would be looking at the alternatives, considering, of course, that there are no unintended con consequences on things like green greenhouse gas or otherwise. Um, combined with that, we recognize and we are addressing the need to upskill the business because not everybody is skilled in the area of the technical requirements about how you might solve for the plastics challenge, uh, or necessarily in systems thinking, which I'm hoping Fiona will allude to, and uh, or certainly Peter will allude to systems thinking a little later. Um, we also need to upskill in design, which is an element Fiona will reference. And then of course, again, we need to train people and help people with how we partner with others to drive this change. And we have an obvious advocacy and lobbying agenda where we work with or um, consult with governments and NGOs around what needs to happen or what would be good policy that could help accelerate a transition to a more circular economy for plastics. I 
think it's worth mentioning a few examples that start to stretch uh, the opportunity, which is um, examples where we're inventing business models that encourage reuse. So I'm quite inspired by the example in the middle, which is our toothpaste brand Signal, that have gone into a format, which is a toothpaste tablet that you would chew and then still brush your teeth as normal using a toothbrush. But what you can see happens here is you end up with a premium, gorgeous looking proposition in a reusable glass container, a radical new format that may be exciting for people to adopt a new habit. Um, and all of this would be then delivered through a model through Loop where you would order uh, and then have your product replenished where the containers are washed and refilled by us and sent back to you. So that's an exciting model. And there was a launch in uh, France announced yesterday and it's happening in New York and there'll be more markets too. I mentioned before the need to work together and bring everyone on board. We are working as a company with players in all of these areas from the experts and academics, including uh, Exeter, uh, some partnership programs in working with the university and the MBA program. There are of course um, some big programs internally around engaging our employees in leaning in to come up with solutions. We work with many NGOs, including the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but also use the likes of, of uh, Tier Fund or Greenpeace as critical friends around uh, making sure that we are doing what we believe is the right thing. Uh, we work with local national government, all of our suppliers, strategic agreements and or contractual arrangements we have with suppliers, and we're investing money in trying to accelerate infrastructure. And of course, in the end, all of this needs to show up uh, in the way in which our brands present themselves to consumers and how we can support the transition. So in the end, what we are trying to do is encourage others and work together for what I would describe as a waste-free world. And uh, this is a photograph I actually took recently with my son on Kilimanjaro. This is near the top. It almost looks as though that that's all there is to the mountain, but it was five days to get to just that point. It was incredible and encouraging to see how there really was zero waste. Anything that's taken up that mountain is taken down. So that would be my vision of what I'd love to see uh, as an end result for all of us. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to Fiona. Thank you very much, um, Gavin, for your terrific presentation. And as you said, we will now um, ask Fiona to share her screen uh, as well. Uh, Fiona, over to you. Thank you very much, Katrina. Um, as you said earlier, um, I'm an Associate Professor of Circular Economy at the University of Exeter Business School. Uh, and for the last 10 years, I've been working with organisations to implement circular approaches, primarily to design, innovation and manufacture, which is, is my, where my background and expertise lies. So I wanted to start with um, this picture. Uh, oh, there we go, uh, this picture, um, which many of you may recognise, it was actually taken at the aftermath of uh, Glastonbury a couple of years ago. And Glastonbury is one of the UK's largest music festivals, and last year alone generated nearly 2,000 tonnes of waste. And amongst this debris, we would be right in expecting to find items such as drinks bottles, plastic food packaging, uh, maybe some personal care items. However, what really surprised me was the 11 tons of clothing and camping gear that was also left behind. And this included things like 6,000 sleeping bags, 5,000 tents, 3,000 air beds, and even 400 gazebos. And unfortunately, this is an accurate reflection of the way that we as consumers value our products currently. It's often more convenient to dispose of products even when they still have a significant amount of economic value and replace them with, with new. Um, and with this in mind, it's easier to understand the statistics that surround the design of, of products in that over 80% of products are thrown away just after a single use. So a lot of, uh, of design is, is based on these single use items. Um, so it's a common misconception that the circular economy is actually about waste or garbage. But actually what the circular economy model does is it encourages us to look at the wasted or idle value that's inherent in many of the products and assets across our society today. 
So if we take the average European car, for example, it only actually spends between five to seven percent of its life cycle being driven. The rest of the time it's being unused on your drive outside your office or stuck in traffic on the M25. Um, a car was designed to be driven and the time that it's actually being stood still is, is really wasted value. And buildings are another example of this, with 60% of European offices remaining empty, even during working hours. So the circular economy encourages us to identify this wasted value and to create new revenue streams and new ways of using and reusing our assets. However, the circular economic loops that we're used to seeing of reuse, refurbish and remanufacture are often far easier to visualise and implement within these higher value products and assets, such as cars, for example, than consumer goods <coughs> and uh, plastics in particular. So I wanted to dig a bit deeper into one of the models that, that Gavin introduced earlier as part of the plastics uh, report. And um, this infographic represents our global plastic packaging flow, which is estimated currently to be around 78 million tonnes per year. And as you will see, 40% of this still goes directly to landfill, with 32% of this leaking into our ecosystems or our oceans, um, and 14% being incinerated for energy recovery. So it's quite shocking to see that only 14% of our plastic packaging is actually collected for recycling. 8% of that makes its way into what's called cascaded recycling, which basically means it's been recycled into a product that's of a lower value than the initial product and only 2% is actually closed loop recycling, which means that say a, a can of Coke is recycled back into a can of Coke or a product of uh, equal or, or greater value. Um, and so often we are, um, when we think about plastics and packaging in particular, we are encouraged to think about recycling and making sure that our bottles and our food packaging makes its way into the right recycling stream. However, um, often we're treating the symptom of um, the, the system and not the actual cause. So I want to talk about how we can design solutions that actually address the cause of our systemic problems and not the system. So through the analysis and th synthesis of different taxonomies that are commonly used in academic literature, combined with different sources of value being reported from industrial organisations all over the world, we have come up with this circular value creation framework, which is based on five circular economy business model archetypes. Um, so uh, as you'll see on the screen, on the left hand side, you have five different business models that range from material efficiency. So thinking about the input of materials that you're using within your process and with your products down to things like cycling for longer. So this is things like um, trying to extend the life of products through reuse, through remanufacture and, and refurbishment, all the way through down to resource sufficiency, which is basically trying to cycle smaller loops uh, faster with less energy and resources. So, for example, um, a lot of manufacturers now are looking at um, access over ownership and, um, and sharing platforms and, and leasing models, for example. So what this model does it, is it demonstrates the link between design and business models. So it looks at where you can um, intervene within a product's life cycle, whether that's right at the beginning um, or throughout the use phase. Um, and I wanted to uh, demonstrate this through uh, a few examples. Um, so the first example that I wanted to use really focuses on the, the, the initial stages, so circular supplies, looking at how we can use different materials to replace plastic in the first place. So this is a company, a startup company called Uhu. Um, so Uhu are a startup who have created a seaweed based alternative to plastic packaging. So as you'll see down on the bottom right of the screen, they initially developed a globule of um, water that was actually packaged in this uh, seaweed material. Um, it's biodegradable in just four to six weeks, like a piece of fruit. You can actually consume it. Uh, it can be flavoured and coloured. And the great advantages are that it um, has significantly less environmental impact uh, than plastic alternatives. And it's actually cheaper than plastic as well. So Uhu have uh, developed some great partnerships uh, with Just Eat, for example. So they're looking at how they can replace um, source sachets, where you'll find in multiple 
restaurants and, and fast food outlets. And these uh, source sachets currently are very difficult to capture value from. They often don't get recycled at all. Um, also, Uhu a couple of weeks ago were at the London Marathon um, replacing uh, water bottles that are a huge waste at, at many sporting events with actually uh, globules of, of water that the runners could, uh, could consume. So they're a really interesting company, really uh, keep your eye, um, eye on them because I think they'll do some fantastic things. And, and I think it's great to, to see how design, designers are thinking of, of really trying to eliminate plastic completely and, and think of alternatives right at the beginning of, of the use phase. The second example that I wanted to, to give was, um, uh, this is an Australian uh, born company called Genappies. So within the UK alone, we dispose of around 3 billion nappies each year. And each of those nappies uses uh, one cup of oil to produce and on average takes about 500 years to decompose in landfill. So what G nappies have done is that they've designed a cradle to cradle certified reusable nappy based on cornstarch material. And if that nappy uh, ends up in landfill, it will biodegrade in just 50 days leaving nothing behind but nutrients for the soil, which is um, a significant difference to the 500 years of um, petroleum-based nappies. So obviously this nappy isn't designed to be sent to landfill and users have the option to either purchase the totally washable option or biodegradable inserts that can actually be composted in the user's backyard. Um, and furthermore, um, users of this corn-based um, nappy report hardly any cases of nappy rash um, and feel much better putting them next to their baby's skin than their petroleum-based alternative. So G diapers and G nappies have had significant success in the USA, uh, the UK, and increasingly Europe. However, they still remain a premium product with only a small percentage of the market. And when multinational organizations and, and retailers can sell nappies for as low as 15 pence per nappy, it's a really difficult market to compete in. So what we've been doing with G is we have been working with them to consider how through the combination of circular design and circular business modeling, they could capture more value from the used nappies by considering things like anaerobic digestion and large scale composting solutions, as well as a sale of service business model. Um, so we've helped them to develop partnerships with childcare providers and third party, th third party waste management companies to create a circular value chain to complement their cradle to cradle certified product. So basically, G are now working directly with um, uh, childcare prov providers rather than the, uh, the parents themselves. And they have uh, the childcare providers then have the option to either have their nappy waste collected, um, after which it will be composted on a region wide scale, or they can actually buy into a franchise model and purchase their own on site small scale machinery that will compress their uh, G-nappy waste into energy briquettes um, or create compost, which enables them to develop their own revenue streams, which is a really exciting way of, of, of looking at it. So offering these new business models enables G-nappies to capture additional value from the waste generated from their product. And also they can then circulate that value back to the users by reducing the cost of the initial nappies. And by targeting childcare providers instead of parents, Gene Appies can upscale their model whilst also decentralizing the system. And this is really interesting from a design perspective, as it demonstrates that having a circular product is only half of the challenge. It's really essential to consider the surrounding business model and the wider system of stakeholders necessary to really circulate those resources and retain uh, the value within the system. And I know that Peter is going to demonstrate the importance of locality, uh, and also scale further. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Peter. Thank you very much, Fiona, uh, for your uh, for a great presentation and for sharing with us the the examples of the very innovative and sustainable companies. Um, I would like to remind uh, our participants that if they have any, if you have any questions on Fiona or Gavin, keep the questions coming. Uh, we will have time to uh, get back to you at the at the end of the webinar. And so without further ado, I will make, uh, I will give the floor to, uh, to Peter now. Okay, so okay. the word is yours. 
Yeah, is that okay, Katrina? Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, Gavin. Thanks, Fiona. Um, what I'm going to talk about in my 10 minutes is um, something that we've been working on since uh, the start of the year, a project funded by our National Science and Engineering Council, which is what do all the ideas that Gavin's presented and Fiona's presented start to look like when you bring it down to uh, a specific system, uh, and in our case, a, a, a regional system. Uh, and I'm going to say what that region is in, in, in a minute. And how do you make sense of the many, many, many innovations and developments and challenges in this area of plastics and the circular economy? And what does it mean for people on the ground? And what, what are we actually trying to achieve? And what does it look like in the future? Oops. No movement on my slide. Uh, no, try clicking and using your arrows or page down. Yeah, I've tried that. Okay. Uh, Do you only have one screen open? Yeah. If so, we can try again. I can uh, okay. uh, make myself a presenter again. Okay. And then get back to you again. All right. Okay. Make myself presenter. Show my screen. Okay. So. Hmm. Not getting any movement on it. All right. Well, I have your uh, your presentation open, so we can go through okay. my. That's great. Um, All right, just bear with me a second. Okay. So I'll just say a little bit about the, the background uh, that we, it's a project involves 20 academics, 60 external partners, and these three counties in the Southwest region of England. Uh, which I don't know whether uh, people listening in today will have visited or, or, or know about. So this is known as the southwest uh, region of, of the UK. Um, and uh, next slide, please, Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this is this is a typical landscape in uh, one of the counties. This is Cornwall, which is the county I'm based in. It's a uh, very very well known for it's been a tourist destination, strong sort of coastal landscapes, uh, strong agricultural base, and that's typical of the of the, the the entire region. And you can imagine just looking at that photograph that when we see in the media on a daily basis issues around uh, plastics and uh, the marine environment, that uh, people who live here or who, or who visit here are deeply sort of interested and, and concerned and at times outraged by this whole whole agenda. So it's a very emotive topic and what we're trying to do in our project is work with that emotion but bring a science to the whole area to understand better about uh, some of the issues, impacts, quantities, flows and, and effects. Um, Exeter is, is I think the home of microplastics. It was a term that was invented here with one of my, my colleagues and it has one of the world's leading health and ecology research groups uh, in the area of, of plastics and particularly microplastics. Next slide please um, Katrina. So this is the, what, the only slide with a lot of words on it but I thought that I just wanted to stress the vision of the project and this is a long-term vision and we're in the first stage of it and Gavin and Fiona are both talked about the circular economy and this central concept of value creation. Plastics uh, are a, a material with potential value, value at the end of their first life or uh, in, in subsequent cycles, but they also cause significant negative externalities if they leak into the environment or into human health. So what we're trying to do is look at how do you develop regional circular plastic systems to optimize circular flows? 
How do you do that? To do that, we're, we've established a, a research hub and a regional network. And what we're trying to do is build transformative circular economy approaches to tackle the challenges of plastics in society. That's all plastics, not just marine plastics, not just uh, food packaging, not just, you know, whatever, not just nappies. So we're looking at the challenge and the relationship we have to plastics in society. And our outputs really are to develop uh, systems level models to evaluate system oriented innovations that uh, Fiona's already given great examples on product innovations that have to be designed into a system uh, for their value to be recovered and, and circulated. Um, you can have cradle to cradle products that go to landfill or incinerated. We've lost a lot of the, the, the value that's been created through the, uh, the excellent design in the first place. And what we're trying to do is design those systems to reduce, reuse, eliminate or substitute fossil fuel plastics. And, and Gavin gave some great, great examples of how Unilever are approaching this. But to do that, the interventions have got to be more cost effective. They've got to deliver superior financial and social outcomes. And they've got to increase overall resource and carbon productivity. It will be very different, difficult outside of regulation to make a positive business case to make the shift uh, uh, compared to the current business case. So what we're looking at is, is, is tools and evaluations that, that enable us to demonstrate proof of concept. Next slide. I'm just going to say a little bit about how we, what some of the things that we're doing. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but the first thing we need is a baseline. We, we need to assemble data on the source, all the sources, their distribution, their fate in water, atmosphere and land. And from that, we need to identify candidate items and target areas for intervention. We need, we need to move from a downcycling landfill uh, leakage model to an upcycling circulation model. That sounds simple, uh, but as, we, as we're discovering, data on these, uh, on, on these particular areas are, are really difficult, fragmented, and often don't exist. Next slide. So where, where are we going? We, we're, we're looking at a wide range of data from local authorities, regulators, industry bodies. Here's just some typical data that we've got on. This is the latest data on the tonnages of uh, household waste from one county in Cornwall. And if you can just read it in the bottom right of, of each bag is the amount of plastic bottles, uh, total tonnage for a, per annum in, in a county like Cornwall and the average um, uh, weight of or fraction of plastic bottles per southwest household in, 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 in our region. So what we're trying to do is establish this baseline to begin to quantify what is the potential value opportunity. What do we do with this material that we're not doing currently and how do we do that? Next slide. And we're quantifying all sources. We're, we're looking at uh, marine plastics from the fishing industry, the growth of plastics in agriculture, medical plastics, plastics in construction, as well as the usual suspects in, in retail brands and, and clothing. So it's quite a complex uh, situation that we're taking on. Next slide, please. And we, 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 have, we have excellent data uh, already on the site on pathways and sinks. Um, and as I said to you before, it's an emotive subject, uh, particularly marine litter and beach litter. This is uh, some, some work that's been taken place over 10 years. This is just one study of the number of plastic items on one beach on one day uh, in, uh, in, 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 in one of the counties in, uh, in the region. Uh, which can then be characterized and tracked back to understand better their sources and their potential impact. And this takes place on a regular basis. Next slide, please. And because we've got excellent data over 10 years, what we're able to do is, is look at chart the progress, the growth, the stability or the decline of uh, plastics from different sources and different pathways across the UK and particularly in the Southwest. This is just showing um, one, one type of data that we're working on to create that baseline model. Next slide. And then what we're looking at is, well, what are the impacts of plastics? We see plenty of uh, images like the one on the right. What we're then trying to do is understand, well, what, what are the likely costs, the, the, the ecological costs, the human costs, the social costs of these uh, materials once they, if they leak into the environment um, or, or are not uh, controlled and managed within particular uh, pathways. This is just one example of marine mammal strandings in, in, in our region. 
and from that we begin to understand you know the relationship between sources pathways and sinks next slide please then what we have to do and where we are at the moment is understand the barriers and enablers identify what has and hasn't worked there are so many there's a proliferation of plastic free initiatives in our region and all over the all over the the, the world how many of them are based on sound science how do we know whether what what people are trying to do is the right thing is there a danger that they're doing the wrong thing what is the link to policy and regulation economic incentives and what we're trying to do is understand better uh, what are people trying to do what's working and which ones are the front runners that we should be backing and investing in in the future next slide please and of course, what we need is a scientific basis for any intervention that we make. Uh, this, this point about uh, some initiatives are running ahead of the science. This is just one very simple, small example from an early part of the work, which was comparing the uh, LCA of, uh, of, of PET bottles versus the equivalent glass, uh, where the glass, and this is, this is for the Southwest region, where the glass currently is uh, taken to Portugal for reprocessing versus PET, which is currently reprocessed uh, in the north of England, um, it's it's a well-known story that that uh, you know glass is heavier, uh, also has its own environmental impacts in the in the process of production, um, and there are significant implications if we start to make a shift from PET to glass at scale. So what we're trying to do is look at a wide range of in innovations that are taking place in, in the region or might take place in the region and look at what their implications might be at scale, both in terms of life cycle assessment, economics, commercial benefits, social benefits. And that's what we're trying to do at the moment is, is scale those up. So we need to avoid the law of unintended consequences uh, and in the Russian to, to do something and, and think we're doing the right thing. We just need to make sure we're not doing the wrong thing and creating and storing up problems for the future. Next slide and last slide. And where we are at the moment, uh, Gavin mentioned all the stakeholders he's working in. We, 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 have, we have over 60 stakeholders, local government, waste processors, uh, farmers, fishing representatives from the fishing industry. And this is a workshop we ran last week where we're trying to map out the current system as the basis for working out what a future system might, might look like. We have another 15 months on the project and what we want by the end is to uh, be able to show what a new plastics, uh, regional plastics economy system might look like and on the back of that quantify what the potential uh, economic, social and environmental benefits of that will be to the region as a basis for forward policy, future investment and working with people like Gavin around their initiatives and working closely with people like Fiona on, on the specifics of individual interventions at the product level or the product service level. So that's that's where we are, that's what we're doing, trying to knit all these things together in one systems approach. And I think that was my last slide. Thank you very much, Peter, for your inspiring um, presentation. Okay, um, so this is the time where uh, when our presenters can ask any questions, so uh, keep writing them down if you, if you want to ask anything to our, uh, our speakers. Um, I would like to thank you again uh, for your presentations and uh, we can open the Q&A and the discussion now. Um, so we have uh, one question for now and uh, it's not directed to anybody. So um, if you uh, feel like you want to answer the question, just uh, just uh, start talking and then uh, we can give a um, uh, uh, Give, uh, give the speech to to another speaker and so on. So uh, feel free uh, to speak. The question stands: How do you inspire design for circularity when consumers' habits seem to be difficult to change? I think there are two Anybody? parts to that question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, there are two parts to that question. The, the one is around inspiring design and the other one is around consumer behavior change and, and the reason i separate those is i think there is an element of, of businesses or innovators designing out waste and pollution in the first place with the products so that they become 
intuitive that there are better problems consumers don't have to think or worry about whether they are, are doing harm or doing good. So, so there's an element of that and there's some programs and things that you can do internally which inspires innovators to design better and normally that would take the, take the form of inspirational examples, looking to biomimicry for inspiration on how nature does things well in a circular economy and, and there are many things that we would use as material to stimulate and inspire an internal audience to want to lean in and, and think differently. From a consumer behavior point of view, I think, you know, an example I always think of uh, a transition from, you would say, an old petro uh, combustion engine model of cars to the Tesla electric vehicle was that when Tesla launched the um, Tesla vehicle, they made it cool. It was a cool, beautifully designed sports car. Um, and so if you can create a product that looks good, that provides a benefit to people that they want, that is also more sustainable. And that's a real win-win. Rather than trying to say to people, you can no longer use this product or that product, or you cannot do this or you cannot do that. I think we should find ways to design things that are built in sustainable or circular, gorgeous and motivating to use and deliver great benefits. And then it should be uh, an easy move for people to say, I'm going to switch to the better version. Thank you very much, Gavin, for your input. Anybody else, Fiona or Peter, that you want to um, um, talk about this? Yeah, I mean, um, just to say that I, I agree completely with, with what Gavin mentioned. And I think actually when we look at um, the field of, of kind of sustainable behavior change, um, it, it talks about really sustainability and how um, sustainability is really from one perspective been almost a stick to kind of beat uh, co uh, consumers and also businesses over the head with kind of in terms of you need to use less uh, you need to conserve more whereas what the circular economy model does is it encourages us to to innovate and, and exactly as gavin said to produce excellent design um that, that consumers are going to want to use and then i think the behavior change isn't a, a conscious decision it's just that's the way in which they're going to interact with that new uh, product and a new way of doing things and i think actually that's the responsibility of, of organizations it's the responsibility of designers uh, to be able to provide consumers with with those products and and those models of, of operating and the services that and business models that support those yeah I, thank I, you I, very I'm, much fiona yeah, I haven't got much to add, but uh, I mean, I, I I think two 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 additional points. One is I've always been inspired by cradle to cradle design and design products, and Fiona gave a great example with G diapers. The challenge for that is to make them affordable or price competitive uh, to the alternatives. The, you know, the inevitable challenge of, of if something's twice the price, you are uh, locking out. You know. Uh, a large number of consumers they'll just they'll, they'll go for the cheaper option so how how can how can we do that um and the second is i mean it's so a flipping the question back um is that in a lot of our work is particularly around plastics is the deep concern people have around toxicology um contaminants um hazardous materials um that might enter uh, enter particularly food packaging or clothing i i think that there is emerging and growing concern about hazardous toxic properties not just in plastics but in many many of our of our products so what we might start to see is is a is a, a real pressure growing on on clarity and uh, greater information and transparency on the provenance <coughs> of materials particularly recycled materials or feedstocks that are going into products and that doesn't answer the question but it's not an inspiration piece it's it's a it's a fear uh, a public fear that which will demand that the, the, there is a uh, a need to be absolutely clear about what's in our what's in our materials and be able to show uh, uh, be able to show uh, custodial chains. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have another question coming 
directed to Fiona and Peter, um, as uh, as you are the experts on the field in uh, from the academic side and academic point of view and research. How can researchers and members of academia have a greater impact on awareness among circular economy practitioners or business managers? What is your personal opinion at communicating with stakeholders from the corporate world? Um, I can I can take this first. Um, so I think it's uh, the answer is is twofold. First of all, there's education, and and secondly, there's research. Um, so a, a lot of the the work that we're doing within the, the Centre for the Circular Economy at, at Exeter is developing new models of educating to develop those necessary skills and capabilities in future leaders um, to lead this transition towards a circular economy. And I believe that actually our current educational model needs to change. Uh, the circular economy by nature is a very multidisciplinary, um, very dynamic field and education <clears throat> really needs to reflect that. Uh, so an example of this is we run a very successful masterclass, which is an online six week course that um, is uh, directly aimed at the corporate world. Um, so bringing um, professionals together from lots of different sectors really to inspire them, uh, to educate them and to facilitate that really important uh, cross-sector, cross-disciplinary learning. Um, and we also uh, are developing a number of education, other educational offerings to do that. Secondly, um, what's really important is the, the research. Um, so I believe that for circular economy, we need to um, collaborate with, uh, with industry um, even more so uh, than the normal scientific research because the, the field is really being uh, led by both. Um, we're seeing examples of organizations that are developing circular models, circular design, circular business models, but, but almost kind of in a, an entrepreneurial way, uh, testing it out, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And it's really important that academia is there to support that, to support that uh, testing and development by providing the foundational science behind it, uh, by identifying the skills that uh, future leaders and, and organizations are going to need. Um, so it's really kind of iterative in terms of how it's developing, in, in my opinion. And I'll leave uh, uh, Peter to elaborate on that as well. Oh, I'm not sure that I can, Fiona. That was a, that was a great, great response. Um, the, uh, just, just to hark back to the project that I, I showed on a slides exemplar that that is designed partly um, on the basis of, of ensuring that academic research is made more accessible to uh, practitioners and to regional stakeholders and it just happens to be the southwest region it could, could be any any region or any spatial scale so at the heart of the project is an e-platform uh, which anybody can join and it has three levels the, open, the top level is like a website the second level is a, a membership area where people can exchange information and the third level is the detailed uh, background uh, research you know the data and everything that not not everybody wants to look at and i think the absolutely critical point in, in all this is making uh, access to expertise advice latest research as simple as possible and as on the go as possible everybody's busy um, haven't got time to wade through long, turgid academic papers. What is needed is, is very engaging, very agile, very elegant tools that, that can, can provide you uh, with, with um, insight and clarity on, on a wide range of topics. Then if you want to go into greater detail, then you can, can make sort of uh, separate arrangements to uh, or separate um, uh, engagement activities, online webinars like this, to go into greater detail, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make make this this, this, this publicly funded research available to as wide a group of people as possible, to make scientifically sound decisions in their areas of practice and and uh, concern. Thank you very much, Peter and Fiona, for elaborating on this question uh, into depth. Um, I have another question that is uh, in relation to policymakers. Do you think there should be more le legislative tools to enhance circularity? 
uh, yeah. Gavin here. So from a business perspective, we would say yes. Um, legislature or things like extended producer responsibility or a version of that, that ends up leveling the playing field, encourages collection and recycling of materials, and um, provides an incentive for people to design smart and so on are always a good thing. This is a systemic challenge. It is not um, one in which we need to all be competing with different agendas, which is comes back to the purpose of today's session, which is how can the circular economy think uh, help us rethink plastics? I think if everybody aligns to the idea of the common vision of the circular economy for plastics, as set out in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation-led New Plastics Economies um, Global Commitment, then business, government, from a policy perspective, and everyone across the value chain can align towards fixing the system. So I would say very necessary, can be hugely useful, and everybody should be supportive of good instruments. Thank you very much, Gavin. All right, it seems that we do not have any more questions for, uh, at this moment. Uh, so if you want to um, discuss or comment on each other, you, you'll, you are free to do so now. And if not, uh, mm -hmm, yes. Yeah, I mean, all, all I would say is, is, is that, that, that the, the three presentations have, have given three aspects of, of the challenge um, and the, what we're trying to do we, we, you know, we're not a we're not a corporate uh, multinational we're we're not a policy maker what what we're trying to do is, is look at this you know universities should be showing leadership uh, around big social agendas big social challenges in the areas in which they are they are based and the, what we are looking to do is is look at how the work that um, Gavin's described and explained you know how would that then start to impact at a regional local level and what actions and policies and infrastructure and investments need to take place at the regional scale to to anticipate the changes that are coming through from that international global national level so there's a there's a logic to to the three presentations um and and you know we're really excited by creating a, a positive framework for change for people who are crying out for guidance and and um, an understanding of what to do you know everybody wants to do the right thing and as Gavin said this is a systemic challenge therefore you need systems oriented approaches to connect everybody together to get them moving in the same direction underpinned by sound science that's really what that, that's really what we're trying to do Yes, exactly. I think we we've made a very nice flow of uh, of the global commitments and then uh, the design and systemic thinking. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much uh, for uh, for your great performance uh, and for the time that you devoted to it. Um, I would like to tell everybody that there will be a recording of the webinar available. Uh, we will send it to you by email, uh, but we will also communicate it on our social media channels and on our website. Um, you can also download the presentation slides of our speakers uh, right now at this moment. It's, uh, you can find it in the handouts uh, section on the GoToWebinar platform. Um, but we, we will also add them to the email that we will send out um, in case you're interested. And uh, if you liked our webinar, uh, you can check out also other, our other activities that we are planning. Uh, on our social media channels, or you can subscribe to our ABIS newsletter on our website. Uh, you can see it on the screen uh, now. We also have a LinkedIn group uh, on ABIS Circular Economy. Um, if you uh, would like to um, continue in the discussions or have uh, any questions after uh, the webinar is ended. 
We hope to see you all on our annual event, Knowledge Interaction Forum, which is going to be on the 22nd May, so uh, in one week in London uh, at uh, Unilever's Development Center for Acres, uh, as we are uh, collaborating with them. And the key theme of this year is driving sustainable innovation to deliver impact. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can uh, get in touch with me. You can see the email on the on the slide. Um, and again, I would like to thank our speakers, and I would also like to thank our participants for being here with us, watching us, um, and uh, having uh, the uh, questions and being active. Um, so thank you again, um, Gavin, Fiona, and Peter for today. It's a pleasure. Thank Have you, a good day. Thanks. Have a great day. I'm going to um, end the webinar now. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.